Healthcare. I'm David Harlow, and I invite you to join me by my virtual hearth as I sit down with healthcare leaders to discuss building the future of healthcare. This edition is recorded live at HIMSS 2019 in Orlando. I have two guests today from CTG and IT Services, provider delivering a range of solutions across multiple verticals. Jeanette Ball and Dana Bensinger are client solutions executives at CTG, and they are both nurses who have decades of experience in clinical care management and healthcare informatics. Welcome, Jeanette. Welcome, Dana. Thank Great you. to be here. Thanks for joining us. So, as value based care ideas have been percolating through the healthcare ecosystem, many stakeholders find that they have a square peg, round hole sort of problem. Among other things, in order to succeed in value-based care, providers need to have a good grasp on historical patient care and cost data and other things, and people don't necessarily have those. And as we always say, you can't manage what you don't measure, and many people have not been measuring stuff that would have been useful. So how have you seen this play out with respect to EHR implementations? I think one of the things we, we first look at is we're very early on in this phase, so we have a lot of folks who are have a, a foothold in both worlds. So in the perspective to the EHR, that gives us a little bit of a challenge um, because it's not like we just said, tomorrow everything is value-based care and, and you're doing it this way or this is the data we're going to give you. We're in that square peg round hole, but we're still in a kind of that oval hole somewhere in between there trying to make it all, all fit. So. For us, it depends on where that provider is at, uh, where that healthcare organization is at in their in their journey to to value based care, and what their needs are for their data. A lot of that data is inherent already there from from a fee for service world, um, so we leverage it. We take advantage of it as much as possible. And as general to tell you, there's a lot of data that we need to start collecting, and that we'll, we can configure our EHR to start collecting that data and using it. Right. So there's there's the things that we have already and things that we don't even have yet, right? Sure. Mm -hmm. You have to have an eye on both. Right. Right? Mm -hmm. And one thing Dana and I were talking about specific to implementation rather than optimization is if you're implementing, then consider where you want to be and don't just take the standard implementation path. Right, Dana? Uh, Think about what innovations you want. And if you're implementing, take that leap forward and maybe do the, the, the cleaner, newer, way to do things than the, the same old path. Right. So could you give a couple of concrete examples? Uh, we all talk about trying to innovate and do things the new way, but some specific examples that maybe you've seen in particular client implementations. Yeah, I think part of what we're, we're seeing, and, and really on the, on, the, on the cusp of that as well, is, is the portal integration. Using that patient-facing portal tool to be able to engage our patient population, to engage, engage our providers, and being able to really use the EHR to the extent that we're that we really can. That's that pushing that envelope. Um, we have customers who are. We talked a little bit this morning about our, our digital front door. Um, putting those tools in the hands of our of our patient population, allowing them the day before they show up for their appointment to check in, to update their social determinants of health, to update their health summary online in an environment and at a time that's convenient to them so that we're collecting data that the provider doesn't need to collect again as soon as you step foot in the door, um, and that we're, that data becomes discrete and actionable. I used an example early on. Uh, I went to my primary care provider, and I checked it in the morning, and I got a clipboard with five sheets of paper, and I'm answering all those questions on those five sheets of paper. One of them was, when did you have your last flu shot? Put my information down there, and I went to my appointment, and my provider says, have you had your flu shot yet? Because that information wasn't discreet, and, and, I, and I followed up with them to say, you know, you know why did you ask that question? It's, well, that information on that paper doesn't make it into the EHR until several days later. Um, I could have easily answered that question from home um, before I even got there, and he would have had that information, um, wouldn't have to answer that question. That question wouldn't have been presented to him in, on his EHR as, you know, don't forget to ask Dana about this. Um, so it just, it makes it the the appointment and the interaction much more seamless. Mm-hmm. Right. We don't expect to pay for our airline ticket at the t- when we arrive at the airport. You know, we put our data in. We're very good at it as humans, right? So why aren't we doing the same thing in healthcare, right? Pay our bill, uh, right. enter our data, uh, mm-hmm. and show up to our appointment where it's already preloaded. Mm-hmm. So how difficult is it to 
get providers to change their workflow to accommodate something that, you know, as you describe it, it sounds like it makes sense. This is a good idea. We need to change things a little bit in order to uh, excel at value-based care. What are the what are the impediments to adoption? Well, with providers, they have they they do tend to like what they like, and it's difficult for them to change. They're not change agent people generally, right? So you always have to manage that. You always have to point out the betterment to the patient, and that seems to kind of help physicians get on board, and the improvement in quality, and that you can show them the improvement in quality because they're all scientists at heart, right? So prove it to them, show it to them, include them, and that helps. If you just plow over the top and don't show them, and then that's when you get a lot of resistance. Well, and I think we're coming off the the meaningful use um, uh, wound that we caused in them in some respects because they perceive meaningful use as making their job more difficult, um, making them do things they didn't want to do. And now we're coming around saying, okay, here's value-based care and we're going to give you something more to do. So I think it, we owe it to our providers to make the, the what we're asking them to do to be seamless and to be easy for them to do. It can't be seen as a as one more thing we're adding on or now you need to do this or you need to do this this way. In all fairness, I mean, they're, they're doing a, a, a fantastic job with the tools that we have. We just have to not make it more difficult for them. And, and we can do that. Um, we look at not just the EHR. Uh, we look at the workflow. Are the right people collecting the right data at the right time in the right place? Our providers shouldn't be collecting some of this data. We should right. have, we should right. have uh, that data collected and, and available to them to, to make decisions on not them collecting the data. There are more, they are our most expensive resource. So team-based care, where you have a team taking care of people instead of just a provider, and dividing that and segregating that is where everybody has to be. So that your MA has a piece, your reception has a piece, your LPN, LPN has a piece, your RN potentially has a piece, so that the, uh, the provider isn't doing it all. It absolutely has to, uh, roles and tasks have to be right. figured out. How much customization do you need to do based on provider organization? I mean, something that comes to mind, uh, something I was discussing recently was trying to adjust the workflow in a particular setting. And there was an idea from the consultant about, well, you know, we need to change the workflow so that person with role X does A, B, and C. And the reaction is, well, the person with role X in our organization is just not capable of doing that for whatever reason, not the individual, but people in that role. So how, it just makes me think, how much do you need to customize the sort of workflow that you're talking about based on the particulars of a client organization? Uh, every client mm -hmm. has their okay. own particulars. Right. And uh, when I'm with a client, I never dictate. I say, okay, what are our objectives? What do we want to collect? What do we need to collect? What are we working in? And then figure out the best person to do that mm -hmm. on the chain. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's it's never uh, a canned response. Yeah, I think a good example of that is um, I'm working with a customer in, in New York State. New York State has a very defined scope of practice for medical assistance. A great definition. I, I wish other states would adopt it, but it very clearly outlines the role. You can do this and you can't do this. Um, our EHRs are really built on a and predicated on a model of an MA doing a, a significant part of this. And in New York State, that there's some things they just can't do. Um, so we've got providers who are doing things that in a practice in another state, an MA would do, a nurse would do. So we, in that respect, we've got to both customize the workflow in the EHR and customize the workflow in the practice. And there are times when we, in our recommendation, we come back and say, if I customize the workflow in EHR, it's going to be kind of a burden on your provider. But if you hire an RN who can do this task, here's the benefits you're going to get. So we'll change the workflow, we'll recommend the staffing models, and we'll also work with EHR. It's kind of a little, little piece of everything. Right. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. We often uh, recommend staffing that may need to be adjusted to meet those demands uh, so that the provider is not doing it all. 
Right. I mean, because otherwise you're just, as we like to say in Boston, uh, paving the cow paths. <laughs> uh, and we don't want to be doing that. I think we've done a fair amount of that. Yeah. And now we have to do some uh, ripping and replacing, it seems. Right. Uh, particularly if we're moving in the direction of value-based care. Um, are there particular, I, particular issues, particular kinds of data points that you would highlight that are important for value-based care that haven't been important before or that haven't been captured? I think there are several things that are rising to the top around value-based care because it's a longitudinal approach and not an episodic approach. So you have to take into effect things like community. How does your community affect the health of that patient? Uh, social determinants of health, those are the true barriers of health. So we have to get really good at finding out about where that patient's life is because there that is where the barriers are and really addressing those so that they can actually reach optimum health right, right. so if they're having food problems or money problem you know uh, utility problems we have to, we might not be able to solve it but we have to be aware of it we have to reach out to community partners and uh, start to really interact with the community to solve the real problems that our patients are looking at. Right, because otherwise, otherwise what you do in the office is just a band-aid, right? Somebody's uh, going to go home and, you know, you tell them to eat fresh vegetables and they live in the city and there's a food desert, you know, they're still going to go to McDonald's and Kentucky Fried Chicken because they don't have an option, right? So you have to work with your community to say, okay, let's get a farmer's market in this community. What do we need to do to make that happen? I have one practice that uh, has started to go down this path, and we, we put in this whole social determinants of health screening, and the physicians really were upset because they were concerned that they couldn't solve the problem, so I don't want to ask the problem. And they were very, very fearful of it. But we, we had to plug ahead because it was a requirement we had to do. And what has happened in six months is just incredible. The physicians have their own team now. That, that interact with the community. They have food pantries they have set up. They reach out to them. So they come to the offices and are in their parking lot. Uh, the, the, there's a group of, I think it's eight or ten physicians that write about it now. And uh, the whole group is involved. And it's 150 physicians. So it's just amazing what happened when you start asking the right questions. Right, exactly. If you start talking about it, you can yeah. really, uh, uh, make change. So it's great to hear. Absolutely phenomenal. If you're just tuning in, this is Harlow on Healthcare coming to you on Healthcare Now Radio. I'm David Harlow, and my guests today are Jeanette Ball and Dana Bensinger from CTG. So I understand that your firm has designed an upgrade to its solution in this area in order to address a value-based care issue. And I've also read that uh, one aspect of development of this uh, tool is a design process that involved uh, not only uh, internal resources, but focus groups with providers, with customers. I wonder if you could speak a little bit about that. You know, when we started the process at CTG, we, we truly believe Obviously, value-based care is, is one of the most important things we're moving forward to right now. We needed to embed value-based care in everything we do. Um, we let the fall, we're at the fall chime forum. Uh, we really started to develop some of our solutions and how we really entwine value-based care and the solutions that we have. Um, they gave some great feedback. Uh, we, you know, we kind of came out with an initial a scope of what we wanted to do and, and kind of put it on the table and, and said, if this is your organization, is this something you would buy? Is this something that you need? Is this valuable to you? And they gave us a lot of really valuable insight that allowed us to, to kind of rethink, reconfigure that solution. We came back here just this morning and, and rolled out uh, kind of a, a, a 1.0 version of the same thing with a focus group. Again, got some fantastic feedback, um, real positive feedback that we're on the right track, but fine-tuned here a little bit, um, which is what, what we've done. Um, and, and really are here to kind of offer that, that solution to them as far as it's not just the CIO that's, that's the buyer of this. It's not just the CIO that's the need of this, but the CIO is, unless it's kind of falling into their, into their, on their desk, you know, fix this or do this piece. So we're there to help and be the resource to them in that, in that process. 
we put value-based care in everything we do. So whether it's our help desk solutions or whether it's our, our uh, EHR or in, in genetics area, it's, it's all with a, 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 a wrapper of value-based care. So as you're, as you're moving more and more in this area, is there anything that falls by the wayside? I mean, I know in terms of like meaningful use or whatever we call meaningful use these days, uh, there are various quality indicators, quality markers, measures that uh, have fallen by the wayside. So we don't, we're not asking you to measure or report on, on X, Y, and Z anymore because everybody's doing 95%, so we don't care anymore. We, we, we moved the needle so that can come off the table. Are you seeing things that can come off the table, or is or would you say that's sort of in the realm of streamlining the workflow that allows things to come off the table, or as providers are moving into a more of a value-based care environment, they can move away from the 12 minute office visit and then there's more room in that way to, to do other things. So what, what do you see as the evolution in the real world based on the changes that you're making in your products and services? The focus is different. It's not about the 12 minute exam. It's about dealing with what that patient needs and a longitudinal platform so that you can help move that patient to wellness, right? So um, what we've decided to look at and help practices with is these insurance companies are coming to them with multiple measures. I want you to do this, 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 and this. We've already moved past collecting vital signs and data, mm -hmm. and our, we're now maturing to measures, right? Not just data points, we got that. Now, now we want um, outcome measures. So look at those measures. Make sure that you have a workflow that supports those measures. Make sure you have, your EHR has been streamlined and you're looking at that technology. And then think about your data integrity. So for every measure, those three pieces have to be considered. And then what's your ROI on that measure? And then, of course, how is your quality, your clinical quality affected by that? You know, is that something you want to pursue? Because providers do have power here to negotiate with their insurers. So, um, you know, the pediatric practice might not be interested in perhaps mere rates, right? right. Or something, right? Mm -hmm. so, so we really have to um, uh, make sure, though, that those measures are meaningful. And then that's how we can prioritize our EHR optimizations, uh, for everything that's being hit at them, well, how do we do X better? How do we do diabetic care better? How do we do congestive heart failure better? Uh, and let's look at what our EHR is offering for that, and what do we need it to do in the future? And how can we really think about that? So um, that's, that's, our, that's what we're thinking. There's always three pieces to the puzzle, not to mention the financial piece. What's the ROI? Prioritize your measures uh, based on those things. Or let us help you do that. And I think we heard a kind of a clear message, too, is, is who we're involving with the organization in that value-based contract when we're negotiating it. Because we certainly don't want to sign up for a contract that we know we can't collect the data. And oftentimes there are people signing up for a contract and saying, okay, here you go, collect the data. And we're like, we don't have that. How did we do that? Um, and, that and that's a, a situation where we've, we've got to work together. We've got to apply some governance to that, to that, and we've got to work together to make sure. Two years from now, we may, that may be a, a contract we want to sign up for, but today we don't have the capability of producing that data or producing that data, as Jeanette said, for the return on investment that we're expecting to get from being in this plan. Right. Yeah. And then that's just a recipe for failure, for right. disaster. That's right. Yeah, absolutely. Right. That's right. So are you involved in the sort of the next step? Are you involved in helping your customers build the analytics engines in order to deliver the population management recommendations that you're talking about? Yes, we have another uh, division, another uh, division of CTG that's all about data and data quality. And uh, analytics lays on top of that. You have to have good quality before you do the analytics. Sure. We're very vendor agnostic. We really try to work with the applications that that uh, health system has already invested in mm -hmm. first, mm -hmm. because it, it's not always good to just buy another try application. Try to move them into something else. Yeah, right. right. So, so this really is layered on top of an EHR. So really maximize mm -hmm. what 
you already have purchased within your EHR, mm -hmm. within what you already have. Look at your data quality. Look at the way you've set up your reporting. Um, make sure it makes sense. Let's have some dashboards moving. Those kind of things first. Right. And let's see how far we can get down the road before you start investing in a population health software. Or it, it, You may not even need it. So we believe strongly in maximizing their investments. Right. And building specific tools, it sounds like, that are going to do what a particular organization needs to do Absolutely. rather than another, another whole Absolutely. layer, it sounds like. Great. Wherever we can. Mm -hmm. We are sitting here at HIMSS 2019, and we've come a long way in terms of uh, value-based care. Uh, been talking about value-based care for, I don't know, 20 years or so, just sort of starting to see this poke its way into the real world. If you were to wake up five years from now, what would you hope or expect would be radically different about healthcare? You can take that as sort of as broadly or as narrowly as you like. Let me, let me, let me go back one. We, we've been talking about value-based care for 20 years, but I think if you go back and look at the work of Lillian Wald in, in the 1800s, she was doing it back then, the social terms of care, she defined them, and, and so we're, we're going back to, to what Lillian did in 1893. I, I think the future here for us is that patient-enabled technology that engages our patients and our providers much closer, um, that that the, the value-based care, the social terms of health should not be a, let's do this. It just should be an inherent piece of the technology. Um, based on, you know, my interaction with that EHR, I'll know if, if somebody is unemployed or they're not filling their prescriptions or they're not, uh, you, know, they, you, know, you know, where they live and what risks are in that geographic region I need to be aware of. I think we're, we're, we're going to push the envelope much more using the, the data, not just in EHR, but the community of data that's out there um, that will help build into our profile of our patients that enable that value-based care. Great. Well, thank you very much. You have been listening to Harlow on Healthcare. Join us at healthcarenowradio.com and let's continue the conversation on building the future of healthcare together at hashtag Harlow on HC. I'm David Harlow, keeping the fire going and holding a seat open for you. Until next time.